All right, so let's go ahead and wrap up the final section of laying the foundation. This is part one of this retreat, and this can be found on page 57 through 59. And it's not a very long section. This is just kind of a wrap up to everything that we've done for the past few days. So let's start with prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. My adorable Jesus, may our feet journey together. May our hands gather in unity. May our hearts be in unison. May our souls be in harmony. May our thoughts be as one. May our ears listen to the silence together. May our glances profoundly penetrate each other. May our lips pray together to gain mercy from the Eternal Father. Amen. And O blessed lady, spread the effective grace of thy flame of love over all of humanity, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And let's say yes to Jesus today. Jesus, I thirst for you. Help me to thirst for you more. Use me, Jesus. Form me into a saint. Make up for all my faults. I trust in you. With Mary's help and with my spiritual father, St. Joseph's help, I give you my yes. Amen. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so today is just clearing up those lingering difficulties. And so Father Gately says, Exactly how is it that Jesus Christ, the head of the mystical body, suffers and therefore desires our consoling love, it continues to be a mystery, right? Following the lead of Pope Pius XI, he explained in the past few days the two ways by, blah, 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 the two ways by which <laughs> we can understand this mystery better. First, by treating the notion of retroactive consol uh, consolation, and second, by explaining how Christ can, in a sense, be said to still suffer even though he's happy in heaven, right? However we explain it, however we explain it, the point is clear. Christ somehow still suffers and longs for us to console him. But make no mistake about it. His longing is not a sign of weakness. He's not emotionally needy or self-pitying as if we were some immature um, you know, or if he were some immature man, that's that's not what um, that retroactive consolation is all about. We can better grasp the idea when we realize that Christ chose to put into his heart such a burning longing for our love and that he did so because he loves us. Let's conclude on this point. Sound theology teaches us that God, because he's God, doesn't need us, his creatures. Further, we know that when the word became flesh, God chose to exist as a man with both divine and human heart. In fact, he chose for his own the most sensitive, compassionate, and loving heart of all. By choosing such a heart for himself, he accepted that he would suffer the most burning desire for love for every human. Because for every human being, we all long for love, right? All of us. You know, at the end of the day, when you sit and you think, what is driving this addiction? What is driving this um, frustration or this emptiness that I have? And if you really just pull back from it, it's that desire to be loved. Somehow, somewhere, deep down, you have lost the feeling that you're either worthy of love or that you deserve love. Or maybe you've never experienced being in true love. And that's what God did. So for every human being, as we long for love, God loves us so much that in Christ, he made himself vulnerable. He made himself need our love from desire. According to Pope John Paul II, this is one of God's great mercies to us. Namely, that in Christ Jesus, he allows himself to be in need of mercy from us. 
When teaching this, perhaps John Paul had in mind a conclusion he had come earlier in his life before he became Pope. And he says, After many experiences and a lot of thinking, I am convinced that the objective starting point of love is the realization that I am needed by another. The person who objectively needs me most is also for me objectively. The person I need most, this is a fragment of life's deep logic. Right? Like, we can't just go around being like, love. Like, oh, I'm going to love. Love is an action. There has to be someone to receive that love. So who are you in love with? What are you in love with? And is your love distorted or is it based in truth? Clearly, the words of this passage apply to human love, and that's precisely why they're appropriate here. In Christ Jesus, God no longer calls us slaves, but friends. John 15, 14 through 15, right? The, the love of a friend to lay down one's life. Now, as Aristotle pointed out long ago, true friendship requires a kind of equality and mutuality, right? Like there's something mutually um, existing in that relationship. It can't be a one-sided thing. Thus, Christ humbled himself and accepted to feel a burning thirst, a need, a desire for our love. So we might enter into a genuine friendship with him. God knows we need him, but how could we be his true friends unless in some sense he also needed us? Of course, there's a big difference between Jesus' need for us and our need for him, right? His need for our love comes from his own great love for us, a love that can't stand to see us perish which is what will happen if we don't love him in return. For when we turn our backs on the friendship and love that God in Christ Jesus offers us, we die. And not only do we die here from this earth, but we die eternally, everlasting life in hell. <laughs> and I'm not trying to scare you. I know people don't want to talk about it like it's not a real place, but it's true. And we have to ask ourselves, what path are we choosing? Life everlasting through Christ Jesus or a life that condemns us to life in hell? Yet Jesus came that we might have life and have it abundantly. And that you can read in the book of John, verse, uh, chapter 10, verse 10. Moreover, the burning desire for us that he chose to have in his heart is that we go to him and love him and thus receive his life and love and spread it to others. So he gives us this love and he wants our love and needs our love in return, but it doesn't just stop there. It should outpour. It should pour out abundantly from our lives onto others. This is this in, oh, it's in this sense that we ought to understand Christ's need for our love, not because Christ himself needs it, but because he sees the hurt and the anguish in every person that when we suffer and when we love Jesus and when we console through our neighbor and love of neighbor, we're consoling Jesus and we're doing his work here and right now. In some, Jesus' need for our love is because he knows how desperately we need his love. He knows that for us, it's a matter of life and death. I hope all the difficulties we might have had with the ideal of consoling the heart of Jesus, have now been resolved, except one. There's one last difficulty I didn't treat here because part two will resolve it. And that difficulty has to do with the misunderstanding that the spirituality being taught here is just about pain and sorrow and no place for joy. As well, as we will see, joy, praise, and thanks have a crucially important role in the living out of our principle and foundation of consoling the heart of Jesus. Um, and he just kind of wraps it up, you know, because it's not about um, suffering as a doom and gloom. That's not what this is about. Um, but it is about the reality that we are going to suffer. Um, 
sin has its consequences and we can make reparation for those consequences and unite those sufferings to the sacred heart of Jesus in a consoling manner through God's love that can come miraculous healing in ways that we can never, ever understand with our peon little brains. Um, but God understands it and Jesus understands it. And that's why he's calling you to this retreat. He's calling you to go deeper. He's calling you to grow more in your ministry. And so just to kind of review a little bit, we, the very first day we were beginning with desire, right? Do you want to be a saint? Do you believe you can become a saint? And then we learned the great principle and spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. If, if you're kind of still on that and you're kind of looking at that, go back and sit through that today. Today is the day you want to kind of wrap up this first part of the book and really sit in this. Um, maybe there was a, a section in there that just didn't sit well with you. <laughs> Go back and sit in it again and see how maybe things come out. Did you fully understand the first things first? Keeping our focus on the kingdom of God first. And then all the second stuff, all our desires and all that second stuff will come to us. Um, and then can we get these um, principles and foundations in one shot? And that's by doing the readings that we're doing now and by the end of this month we'll have all the principles and foundations we need to grow in holiness and in sainthood and so what are the principles and foundations that God is putting on your heart through this retreat and then the difficulties of re retroactive consolation or you know if Jesus is heavy how can I console his heart um, you know struggling between those two things and so Go back and reread some of your notes from the past few days. This kind of wraps up about day five. So today is a good day to kind of go and just reflect a little bit back on some of the questions. Did, did God answer your prayer? If he didn't answer your prayer, maybe today sit and just listen and just wait with the Lord. Um, maybe he's just testing to see if you'll ask again. Um, you know, a lot of times we just make assumptions. Well, God knows what I need. Yes, but he loves to hear us ask. And so that's my prayer for you today. And let's see if there are any other questions that just kind of wrap this up. But I think that's it because I don't want today to be about new information as much as uh, reabsorbing the past few days that we have done thus far because it has been deep. We are just laying the foundation <laughs> and it is deep. But this is really good. Pay attention to your feelings and your thoughts as you're reading this information. The Lord is speaking to you. Are there any questions that arise? Is there any fear about making this commitment to console the heart of Jesus? Any excitement about starting a journey to a life focused on consoling Jesus? What changes would take place in your daily life if, you if your love of Jesus your response to his appeal for mercy and consolation were to be your first principle and foundation? That's a great question. What changes would you have to make in your life in order to meet this commitment of first things? Putting Jesus' consolation first. Desiring him first. What things would have to change and are you willing to make that sacrifice? Would people around you see any change in you? And would you, would you see, and what would they see? What would they see? But also, would you look in the mirror and see the change? So, change is not bad. Change is not bad at all. Um, we will go over that tomorrow. Yeah, I'll go over that tomorrow. So, laying the foundation... There's a lot, first principle and foundation. Um, you had some history lessons. You had some prayers. There was a lot to kind of dive into. So post your questions if you have them. But today is about reviewing what you've done the past few days. Um, sit in, go back, reread some of the quotes. Go back, reread, and see if it speaks to you differently today.
All right. So I did find this little prayer, and I think this is really good for us moving forward because the next session is called Overcoming the Obstacles to Living in This Foundation. So maybe you're like, yes, I want to. I just don't know how I'm going to do this. That's what this whole second part is all about is how to overcome the obstacles that you're going to see in your life by making this commitment because Satan doesn't want you making this commitment. He likes you being lukewarm. He likes you being teeter-totter and on the fence because if he can catch you on that wrong side of the fence, and my friend, we're not guaranteed tomorrow, then who's got your soul? And that's a serious question we really have to examine day to day is was I lukewarm today? And thank you, Lord God, you gave me a chance to get up and try again. Lord, have mercy, right? So um, let's close. This is from the book of Micah. It's an Old Testament prophet. And you can find this um, just before the New Testament. It's just kind of mixed in with all those prophets. And it's chapter 6. And it goes down to like chapter... I think it's verse 8. So chapter 6, verse 8. And it says, What the Lord requires of you, only to do justice and to love goodness and to walk humbly with your God. Right? And I'll close with this prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Loving God, you have loved me into life. That in turn, I might listen and respond to whatever you ask of me. Your desired response sounds so simple, and yet it is so difficult to act justly, to love tenderly, and to walk humbly with you. Help me to discover how best to respond to all that you desire in me, for me, and from me. This is all you ask. This is all I desire. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a blessed day, and we will start part two tomorrow. Be blessed, my friend. Bye.